Welcome to Buried Secrets, a podcast about the paranormal, the occult, and weird and forgotten history. I'm Chris. I am back talking about Randonautica this time, and as usual, this series is going to be a little longer than what I planned for it to be. I feel like any time I do a series, it ends up being at least like 30% longer than I thought it was going to be. But at any rate, I had wanted to cover synchronicity, memetics, the despair meme, and my own experiences with Randonautica all in one episode. But once I sat down to write it, I of course ended up with way more material than I expected. So this time I'm just going to talk about synchronicity. Next time I'll cover memetics and the despair meme. And then the time after that, I will touch on more of my own experiences with randonauting. One more piece of housekeeping before I get into the body of the episode, but about a year ago, I switched this podcast to become bi-weekly, but lately I've been finding that my episodes have been going pretty long, so I'm going to try switching back to weekly, and ideally I'd like to try to keep the episodes more in the 30 to 45 minute range, so let's see how that goes. Oh, also, I'm recording this very early in the morning because lately the radiators, even though it's April, the radiators have been very loud at night. So I'm trying to record in this period in the morning before the radiators turn on and also before a bunch of people are out and about. So you might hear some birds singing outside because it's early. And apologies if my voice sounds a little weird or different than usual. I think my voice is both deeper and more hoarse in the morning, so this is the price we pay to not have a squealing radiator in the background, right? So anyway, before I get into synchronicity, I do want to give a real quick summary of what Randonautica is, since I see the download numbers and I know that y'all listen to series out of order, which by the way, is totally fine. You should listen to whatever you're most interested in. There's nothing wrong with that. But... If you're just jumping in here, Randonautica is a free app that you can download. The way it works is you set an intention in your mind and it uses some science-y algorithmic what's to direct you to a point. You go to that point and there you will often experience strange things either en route or at the point. It's a great way to get yourself to go outside and have adventures in your area and also a really easy way to interact with the paranormal or the strange around you. And if you want any more detail about how to use it, listen to the previous episode. I talk about that there. So like I said, in this episode, I want to talk about synchronicity. And just to paint a visual picture for you, I am wearing my t-shirt that I got when I saw the police perform live in 2007, I have a synchronicity album cover t-shirt, which, you know, if you're not a huge fan of the 1980s band, The Police, you might not know that they have an entire album called Synchronicity. And there's not one, but two songs on that album called Synchronicity. Synchronicity 1 and Synchronicity 2. So, that album is where I first learned about synchronicity back when I was in high school. But synchronicity is a huge buzzword in the paranormal nowadays. If you're a fan of the documentary series Hellier, like I am, you'll know that synchronicity plays a really big part in the narrative there. And just in general, I'd say most people who are into investigating the paranormal or researching it always have an eye out for synchronicity. Right now, both synchronicity and then liminal spaces, which I talked about a few episodes ago, are just really hot concepts in the paranormal. And I can certainly see why they're popular. So just in case you don't know what synchronicity is, a quick definition is that it is a meaningful coincidence that doesn't seem to have an obvious cause. Looking for and finding synchronicities can be really personally impactful. Like I said in Paranormal Investigation, a lot of people interpret synchronicities as an indication that something strange is going on, or maybe that they're on the right track or about to find something important. Oh, and this is a side note, but something kind of interesting popped into my head while I was thinking about this concept of synchronicity and what it means to us as humans kind of whether or not you know what synchronicity is, 
you know, people talk about signs from the universe, etc., and they often mean a synchronicity. So a synchronicity is a meaningful coincidence with no obvious cause. But nowadays, on social media and elsewhere, it's very likely that we're running into coincidences, maybe even meaningful coincidences, that do have a really real cause. An algorithm. Obviously, these algorithms are made to drive up engagement and to get you to spend more time and pour more of your attention into these platforms, and of course, to better target you with ads. And they do this by hitting you with the things they know you're most interested in in a moment that you're most emotionally vulnerable to succumbing to what they're trying to get you to do. And I think this is actually a pretty interesting thing to think about in comparison to synchronicity. I wonder if there's an unconscious part of our brains that, even though we know an algorithm is at work, still responds to that sort of targeted coincidence, as if it was a synchronicity or a sign from the universe. You know, I think most of us know if we've just been talking about something or googling something, we will probably see an ad on Instagram related to the thing you were just talking about. And maybe at first, before we were all savvy about what the algorithm was doing and the ways in which these companies spy on you, basically, we might have thought, "Oh, this is something I was just thinking about getting. This is a sign from the universe for me to get it, etc." But yeah, I do wonder if there's something still in our brains that feels that way, like unconsciously, even if we now know the cause of these quote coincidences that algorithms bring us all the time. I don't have any answer here, but it is an interesting thing to consider. Anyway, back to synchronicity. The idea of synchronicity comes from Carl Jung, the famous Swiss analytical psychologist. You probably know who Jung is, and I've talked about him before. But just in case, it's worth mentioning that in addition to being a respected psychologist, he and Freud were close for a while before having a dramatic falling out. He also wrote some influential stuff about paranormal topics like UFOs, alchemy, etc. So, with all of that said, I did want to dive into what the official guide to Randonautica. Everything you need to know about creating your own random adventure story by Joshua Langfelder and Auburn Salcedo has to say about synchronicity and randonauting. To read a bit from the book, due to synchronicity being an essentially unconscious phenomenon, the repressed or unconscious parts of people can reveal themselves while randonauting. But as with all ways of understanding darkness, the method is blamed. People assume that randonautica itself is picking creepy and negative locations. When in reality, the users are given precisely what their intention is. In truth, owls are the perfect symbol of the randonauts' experience. They go out into the unknown in search of things with a wide-eyed curiosity. The book calls randonauting a sort of waking dream space because synchronicity logic is much like dream logic, where things are connected based on how they're related, and the experience is full of signs and symbols that can be interpreted, much like signs and symbols in a dream. And the book also talks about how there's a sort of alchemical process that happens when randonauting, where you undergo an inner transformation and see things differently. Theoretically, you're exploring your blind spots, going to places you haven't been before, and taking the time to pay attention. Synchronicities are slippery, so you definitely want to make sure to write them down and keep a good record of your randonauting. I don't follow my own advice all the time, but often when I look back at my randonauting notes. I see stuff that I didn't really notice before, and themes start to emerge throughout trips that maybe weren't obvious at the time. But looking at it all together, suddenly there are some interesting things to see there. So a lot of people have reported really strange synchronicities when using Randonautica. I'd like to put forth this theory I have that synchronicities happen more often. When thinking or talking about randonauting, and you don't even need to be interacting with the randonaut app, you just need to be engaging with the idea of randonauting, and more synchronicities happen. Of course, this is just based on my own anecdotal evidence. I'm really curious if other people have had the experience of weird synchronicities while talking or thinking about randonautica, but not actively using it at the time. So please let me know if that has happened to you as well. I'll give some examples of that. So the first example is 
my friend and I were going for a walk at St. Michael's Cemetery here in Queens. And I was telling her about how I was working on these episodes for the podcast about randonautica, and she had never heard of randonauting. So I was explaining it as we were walking around, and I started talking about synchronicity and the significance of synchronicity in randonauting. Maybe 30 seconds later, we walked by a tombstone that marked the graves of a family whose surname happened to be Jung. We had a laugh about that. And, you know, I walk around that cemetery all the time. I've never noticed this Jung tombstone. And as we kept walking, about a minute later, maybe less, we came across two tombstones marking the graves of some folks with the last name Freudenberg. And that really stood out to me as a synchronicity because Jung and Freud were connected. And, you know, of course, Jung's a synchronicity guy, so that's why It was significant that we ran into a tombstone that said Jung on it. So here's another synchronicity that I've run into recently around Randonautica. So while rereading the book, The Official Guide to Randonautica, during a trip to Austin last month, I encountered a couple odd synchronicities. So this one had sort of a sense of humor that I feel like Randonautica has or, you know, whatever intelligence is animating Randonautica has. So my wife and I were in Austin about a month ago. We were walking over by Zilker Park, about to go to the airport. We were kind of just killing time before we needed to catch our flight. So I was already planning what I was going to do on the plane, which was to draw episode art for the Randonautica episodes and to keep rereading the official guide to Randonautica. So my brain was kind of already in Randonautica world. We needed to call a lift to take us to the airport. So we walked up from the Riverside walkway we were at, and we ended up near the Umlauf Sculpture Garden and Museum. So we went to that parking lot and requested a lift from there, since that seemed easier than standing by the side of the road. From the parking lot, you could see a few sculptures and installations, and I saw one that looked kind of like a fairy ring. It was a ring of blue and white tiles set into the grass next to this beautiful babbling brook. It was so enchanted looking. I've always been fascinated by fairy rings from a very young age, and it was such a nice, peaceful, and meaningful moment on a day that had been pretty stressful. We were supposed to fly out the day before, but our flight got canceled, so we'd been scrambling to you know, find somewhere to stay, etc. It had been a stressful day. As I was standing there looking at the ring, the fairy ring, I thought, oh, this is such a nice synchronicity. And then I second-guessed myself and I thought maybe I was using the term synchronicity too loosely. Maybe me stumbling across this meaningful piece of art wasn't really a synchronicity. I don't know about you, but anytime I have an experience that seems possibly paranormal or anomalous or synchronistic, I always have this whole thing in my head where I try to talk myself out of believing that it has any meaning. So I was at that stage and I went up to the placard that had the artist's name and title of the piece. And it was literally called circle and then in brackets, synchronicity. In case you're wondering, it's a 2014 piece by Margot Sawyer. If you want to look it up, I'll also include a picture of it in the show notes. But that's just really emblematic of the type of synchronicities that I find while using or thinking about Randonautica. I couldn't help feeling like it was very pointed and directed at me. You know, we could have stopped anywhere and waited for our lift, but that's where we happened to go, and that's what I happened to see there. So then the third synchronicity that's happened lately, honestly, all these have happened in about the last month. The third thing that's happened lately was I had a weird synchronicity while researching this episode. So I get on the airplane in Austin. I'm rereading that book and listening to music. I was listening to a seven and a half hour long playlist, which was on shuffle. While reading the part of the book about how studies have shown that people can psychically have an effect on random number generators, I thought about how I wanted to listen to a particular song, but I didn't feel like exiting out of Scribd, which was the app where I was reading the book, to go to Spotify and switch the song because I didn't want to get distracted, and also my phone is garbage and sometimes freezes up when I 
try to open Spotify. So I thought, well, this book says you could have a potential impact on random number generators using your mind, so why don't I try to influence the algorithm on Spotify's shuffle feature so the song I want comes on. It was a quick thought. I wasn't holding it in my mind or really focusing on it. I just mentally stated my intention almost as a joke and kept reading. And sure enough, the next song that came on was the one I thought of. In case you're wondering, I had been listening to Dreamland by Pet Shop Boys featuring Years and Years. And the song that I wanted to come on was Small Town Boy by Bronski Beat. I definitely thought of Small Town Boy because of Dreamland, since Pet Shop Boys and Bronski Beat are both queer 80s bands. Now, maybe you're listening to this and thinking, that's a weird coincidence, but not an impossible one. Which, sure, that could be said of any synchronicity. I can't see how many songs are on the playlist because Spotify hides that information for some reason, but if we assume the songs average about four minutes long each, it's probably made up of about 113 songs, so that's a 1 in 113 probability of any song playing. So it's not likely, but it's not the longest odds either. And I do have to acknowledge that Spotify Shuffle is actually less random than you think. There are a number of articles, which I'll link to in the show notes, about different issues with the Spotify algorithm not being truly random. I can tell you, I listen to this playlist pretty often, and I definitely don't actually believe that their algorithm is random. I assume that they favor songs where they get better royalty rates, though who knows. But I can tell you that Dreamland is not one of the ones that plays more often than others. And I looked it up, and it is on a different label than the tracks that play more often. There are a handful of songs published by Interscope that I've noticed play way more often than the others. Maybe it's just coincidence, but I don't really think so. But all of this kind of doesn't matter. I did want to address the most low-hanging objections to the synchronicity, or low-hanging fruit among the objections, I guess is the right way to say that. But the important thing here is just that a lot of weird synchronicities happen around Randonautica, like more than usually happen to me in my daily life. And for me, each weird thing that happens in Randonautica has a possible rational explanation, of course. You know, this isn't like a fictional fantasy book or movie or something where like things are happening that are 100% impossible. Like that's just not the world we live in. Weird things happen, but they tend to be within the realm of possibility. If something wasn't possible, it wouldn't happen. So anyway, however, when you thread all of these mini synchronicities together, then it starts to look interesting. But if the thing I said about how maybe you can influence a random or random-ish algorithm, at least a shuffle feature algorithm, with your brain, if that's a real thing, I do have to address something from a few episodes ago when I talked about the solo Estes method. So if you want to know all about that, listen to that episode. But basically, I proposed a version of the popular Estes method paranormal investigation technique that would work for solo investigations. And the way that works is instead of having a physical person there asking questions, you have pre-recorded questions on shuffle. And the person who is providing the answers is plugged into a spirit box, so they can't hear any of the questions. And the idea is that it's supposed to be kind of random or, you know, you're, as the person listening to the spirit box, you're not supposed to know what questions are being asked. So that way you won't hear what you want to hear. You know, even if you're doing that unconsciously, that just tends to happen. So that was my way of doing it solo. I think it works pretty well. However, if a human can potentially psychically have an effect on random number generators and shuffle algorithms on music players, then it means that it's possible that you could unwittingly have an effect on what question comes up. I don't have a real solution for that, aside from saying that it's just something to be aware of, and it's a argument for being in sort of a meditative state while doing the solo Estes method rather, th rather than trying to think of what questions might come up. So if you're using the solo Estes method, just be aware that that's a possibility. Now, you could argue that I just think that I run into synchronicities when thinking about Randonautica, 
because thinking about random nodding makes me think of synchronicities and that makes me more likely to notice them. So just to be clear, I always have an eye out for synchronicity. I love synchronicities and it's not just something that I have in mind when thinking about Randonautica. I think that synchronicities are really cool and interesting and I like thinking about them and trying to interpret them, etc. But I do want to give a word of caution here. As I've said before on previous episodes, as you make connections and spot synchronicities and make meaning from the world around you and strange things happening around you, just make sure that you're using your judgment. I talked about this in more detail in my episode, The Demon in the Basement, but I do think that it can be really easy to fall into conspiratorial thinking. In particular, in paranormal investigation and experiences like random nodding, there's a focus on looking for patterns and following your own emotions. And I think there's a time and place for that. And that time and place is paranormal investigation and random nodding. But be careful, because while those are important muscles to develop for interacting with the paranormal, they're also the same muscles that are used in conspiratorial thinking. I do worry that it's possible to get really used to looking at every facet of life in the same way that you look at synchronicities, for example. And I just want to caution you against that. Also, while I was working on the script for this episode, the popular YouTuber PhilosophyTube, or Abigail Thorne, released a really awesome video about transhumanism that had a great bit about conspiracy theories. I mention it for a couple reasons. One, honestly, if you're interested in random nodding, you're probably also interested in transhumanism, so you should check it out. And you can find it just by searching transhumanism philosophy tube, or I've got a link in the show notes. But in the video, Thorne has a great metaphor for what conspiracy theories do, like how they're different from other theories. And basically the way she put it is that conspiracy theories are about expressing something emotional rather than a statement about how the world is. So if you're a scientist saying that the Earth is about 93 million miles away from the sun, then other scientists can take that fact and talk about it and talk about how they might measure it and refute it if they want to, but they have a factual statement to react to. But if you and a friend go to a movie and you say, I think that was a good movie, it doesn't really make sense for the friend to say, well, how can you prove it? Because you weren't trying to express an objective truth. You were trying to have a social interaction. And Thorne argues that conspiracy theories are that second sort of statement disguised as the first kind. So opinions disguised as truth. And because you can't really argue with opinions the way you can argue with facts, you don't really need to prove opinions the way you're expected to prove facts. And conspiracy theories become very fluid and vague and difficult to debate. So the reason why I mention this here is if I say something based on my own subjective experience of random nodding or anything related to the paranormal or anomalous, I am really just talking about my experience. And I may theorize things and find patterns and talk about stuff using somewhat scientific terms but I can't prove or measure what I've experienced. I also don't come at this with an automatic assumption that you will or should agree with everything I say or take it as truth. I would suggest that you apply that same standard to yourself. It can be easy to fall into patterns of fear or superstition and to see patterns and assume some sort of specific intent when it comes to the paranormal. To some extent, that's fine. And any sort of engagement with or interpretation of the paranormal requires you to do a bit of that. But it can be easy to make an assumption or hear a theory that someone has and start to believe it to your own detriment or to the detriment of others. I especially think this is important to consider in relation to random nodding because a lot of random nodding is disguised in a sort of scientific or at least science adjacent language. We're looking at quantum points with z-scores, etc. I have a suspicion that because random nodding has more of a science-y vibe than, say, an urban legend, it might be easier to fall into a pattern of taking things too seriously and maybe even spreading a sort of superstitious thinking into your own daily life. Use your discretion if you feel like you've lost the thread. Talk to a trusted friend or, even better, a mental health professional. I think that if you're feeling consistent fear relating to your experience with random nodding or the paranormal, that's probably the time to look for trusted, grounded, external help. But you know your own needs better than I do. Oh, and obviously, all of this is just my own opinion. During this series, I am referencing the official guide to Randonautica a lot, but I'm obviously not speaking for the creators of Randonautica in any way. This part really is just my opinion. All right, so that's synchronicity and Randonauting. 
You can check out the show notes with the script for this episode and sources at buriedsecretspodcast.com. You can email me at buriedsecretspodcast at gmail.com. Please send me any of your interesting randonauting stories. I'd love to hear about what weird experiences you've had randonauting. If you like this episode, please tell your friends about it. Please rate and review on Apple, Spotify, or Podchaser. And also, I just wanted to remind you that I do have a Patreon now, which you can access at patreon.com slash buriedsecretspodcast. I've got my solo Estes session kit on there. And also, by the time this episode is out, I will have posted a draft version of an interactive Google map that I've been working on since January or so. I've talked about this on Instagram, but I've designed this map to be a resource for people who are researching the paranormal or anomalous in New York City, or honestly, just people who are interested in looking at a large and detailed map of all sorts of urban legends and hauntings, etc. because it is fun. Even though I put it together, it is fun to look through the map and kind of like zoom in on an area and see all these weird things that have happened. It's still very much a work in progress, which is, you know, why I'm sharing it behind a paywall on Patreon rather than sharing it super, super widely. But right now the map has 47 paranormal encounters, one UFO sighting, 57 historic structures and cultural sites, 11 important events, 153 urban legends and rumors, 73 burial grounds and famous graves, and that includes defunct cemeteries, you know, that no longer exist, and 46 indigenous villages, trails, and names. The way it works is you go to this map and all these things are marked on the map. If you click on any of the points, a little box will come up with a description, maybe some pictures, sources, other information. And a lot of the places I've marked on the map no longer exist. So my thought is that if you have something strange happen or you're researching a place, ideally you could go to the map and see that maybe there used to be a cemetery there or there used to be a mansion there or a conflict happened there or whatever. Filling out this map is a huge undertaking. So like I said, it's a work in progress. As you might guess, my focus so far has been mostly on the Bronx and Queens and Manhattan. I have much less in Brooklyn and Staten Island, but I'm continuing to work on filling it out. It's been a really fun project, and I've been hesitant to share it because, like I said, it's going to continue being a work in progress. So I think Patreon is the right place for it to live. So if you want access to that or to the Solo Estes Method Kit, subscribe at patreon.com slash buried secrets podcast. I'll also put a note in the episode description that, you know, has a link. And keep an eye out for other cool stuff that I'm working on and we'll post there. Also, a huge thank you to my friends at the Lunatics Radio Hour podcast for joining my Patreon. If you don't already listen to the Lunatics Radio Hour podcast, definitely check them out. They're focused on the history of horror and they look at both horror movies and paranormal stuff, including a lot of New York City paranormal things. And they also have a Patreon where they have all kinds of cool stuff like bonus episodes about horror movies, stickers, issues of their magazine, etc. And you can check out their Patreon at patreon.com slash lunaticsproject. That's all I've got for this time. I'll be back next week. Thanks so much for listening.